Welcome aboard Free Dive with Seapoint Digital, your go-to podcast for deep dives into the world of digital marketing. I'm Christy. And I'm Anna Lynn. Your hosts navigating through the currents of growth, strategy, and innovation in the digital realm. We're going to talk. We're going to laugh. It's going to be a good time. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Free Dive podcast. We're going to mix things up a little bit this week. Uh, Christy's not on the podcast, so I know that's going to disappoint everybody, including myself. Uh, but I think we've got a fun conversation ahead of us because we've got Kevin here with us. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I feel a little, uh, you know, you're disappointed that I'm here, but that's okay. Not we, really disappointed. We, I, I like we, your, like, longtime listener, first-time caller for, vibe. It, that's exactly what you're getting here because uh, I have been listening to, to Christy for quite a long time. And I saw some interviews with you on the podcast, and I enjoyed them. So I like the one on AI that you did a few months back. Thanks. Yeah, I got a... I was kind of doing a, a little bit of a deep dive on that topic at the time, so I happened to find it. But um, how, where are you at on that topic right now, on the topic of uh, AI? Yeah, I think I'm, I, I'm still exploring new stuff coming out. Um, I think everybody in the office knows I've become a big fan of Suno, which is a music generator. And unfortunately, I've made songs for pretty much everybody in the <laughs> office, and so they could all have their own theme songs. And also my other friends who also have been like, what is Bill doing making me these personalized songs? But, yeah. you know, that's been my latest one. Yeah. But, yeah, so just for background, everyone, uh, Kevin Burns, who's with us, is our newest employee at Seapoint. And he has been working remotely for, what, for a few months now? Yeah, about since, three. since yeah. springtime. Yeah, since springtime. Working remote. He's an expat out of the country. And so this is his first opportunity to get to the office, and we've been doing some training, and so it seemed like a perfect opportunity to get Kevin on the podcast. And we thought with that, um, format-wise, we thought Kevin could uh, do his best Charlie Rose impersonation. <laughs> He's always wanted to be Charlie Rose. Pre, so years, pre-cancellation. Yeah, pre-cancellation pre- Charlie Rose. <laughs> Not creepy Charlie the Rose. The nice version yeah. that we all knew yeah. about before the New York Times article. Yeah, your thoughtful grandfather. That's right. Charlie Rose. Yeah. Yeah. And so give Kevin the opportunity to ask questions and do the interview. Yeah. So and I'm going to hand that over to you. Thank you. And what a great way to get to know you and the company that I uh, now get to work with. So thank you very much for uh, having me in. <laughs> so what I understand is recently you celebrated 13 years uh, here at Seapoint. Yeah. And it's grown from one guy. Yeah. You and now... How many how many employees do you have now? Yeah, so we're about twenty right now. It kind of fluctuates, you know, as far as projects and then you know t- turnover. But we, we're steady right around twenty right now. So it's definitely from those early days of being in my kitchen. So I'd imagine that starting off at one, it doesn't feel very stable in the beginning, because it's just one person with trying to balance all kinds of things. It's not that it didn't feel stable. It was just the difference in scope and what you could accomplish. Yeah. So when you're just one person, it's really the knowledge you have okay. on a technical level. And, you know, you're more of a consultant. You know, you can you kind of have to stay in your lane. Like for me, it was uh, PPC management and SEO, kind of those technical yeah. parts of marketing. Um, but there was a lot like I'm, I'm not a graphic designer. You know, I drive stick figures. I don't know video right. production. Uh, I, I, I don't make the words as nice as other people <laughs> here make words. Yeah. So, you know, it was just more like you just limited what you could take right. on. So you appreciate having creative, having Vanessa, having uh, bloggers and all these things to help out. Yeah. And you think about like Anna Lynn as the uh, creative director, like having having someone that who can, you know, take something technical and make it beautiful and and make it marketing content, you know, just, you know, again, like in Vanessa, having someone with that experience, not just graphic design as an illustrator, but like understanding the business, um, you know, any, anytime you kind of like tack that capability or bring someone new into Seapoint uh, with a specific skill set, it just, it, it gets exciting because you're like, oh, what can we do now? Right, you open up new new pathways. Yeah, what you can do providing services to these uh, to your clients. So that's an interesting uh, kind of a, a little side point you bring up. Being able to do new things for clients is it? Have you found any uh, 
any stories when it comes to introducing new 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 skills that you have in the company to a pre-existing client? So yeah, that has been an interesting one because sometimes we'll have done something for a client for a number of years mm -hmm. and we almost forget we're not the type of agency that's quick to like upsell. Um, so it's it's kind of funny like there's been times we've been working with a client maybe like two, three years and we've been delivering certain services and then all of a sudden the client's like, oh, I think I need to hire someone to do X, Y, and Z. Like I need to hire someone to be a content writer and I'm like, whoa, you – you know, we do, we do that at C point and they're just like, oh, you know, because it just hasn't come up in conversation. So, you know, that is the funny part about like how can I, – I've always find it exciting like when we get somebody new in the office and they might have a specific skill set to think like, oh, wow, how can we use them on these other projects, you know, to, you know, just make our services better. So you don't want to over market yourself to your clients, I see. Yeah. That's good. Um, so balancing – your life with 20 employees now and it's been about that size for a year or two yeah i would say about probably the last year we've been about that level yeah. um the last three years have been last three years have been a growth period for us yeah. as far as personnel goes um we were probably around the 10 mark i would say before that um so like in the last three years it's kind of ramped to that next level mm. and how does it how is it running a a company about that size here in Maine? It has its challenges. Um, it, marketing especially, like it's, you know, has its own challenges where uh, your clients are farther away. It's not just running a company like staffing for 20 local people. Um, so clients are farther away, personnel is farther away because you can go out and get somebody who doesn't have to be in the southern Maine market. Right. You know, if you can find the right person, you know, like yourself, People are all over the place as far as working environments. So, right. you know, the, those are the advantages of it. Um, but it's it, it, it's it can be a lot to juggle. Um, for me, the biggest challenge, I think, was going from like very, very like hands on client side with like the technical things like, oh, how's the how's the Google ads performing? As we've gotten bigger, my role has become more of. How do we keep the agency moving in a direction? How do we empower the people that work at Seapoint to do their best work without getting frustrated? And yeah, yeah. is there a lot of uh, kind of push pull or stress when it comes to bringing on new people, but also keeping in mind that the budget, because you have new clients coming in, you have the existing budget, your monthlies coming in, but then you you need to expand on the employee side, and it's not like you have this massive surplus in January, so let's bring in three new employees, all this. How do you handle that? Yeah, that is a difficult it to balance because it's it's hard because you don't want to overextend. You know, if you have extra personnel uh, that are not being capitalized, um, capitaliz you know, user capitalization, mm -hmm. you don't want to bring people on that aren't going to have work. And just the cost of the overhead on to the, to the business is just not. But then that balance is um, making sure you have enough work or the work that's coming in that you're not turning down stuff that's a good fit. So I, that really is always the hardest balancing part because it's, it's like a chicken and the egg. You know, you're not going to get new customers if you can't fulfill their needs, um, but you don't want to get the personnel if you don't have the customers. Um, I think we've been really fortunate. Um, we've made hires, and at the time I've been think I've thought to myself, wow, I've kind of gone out on a ledge here as far as hiring somebody as far as could I fully utilize them? Like, I know I need their skills. I know I need their experience, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to utilize them as to the to the value. Right. And then, but it just, it seems like every time we've hired like that, the pro project will come up and work has just accelerated in that regard. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because yeah. I can imagine that that could be a really stressful moment where you bite off something because you're extremely loyal it seems like all the employees here are extremely loyal to you. And so the the idea of, oh, let's try this out, and if it doesn't work out, we'll just get rid of a couple of people is not the mentality here. Right, and that is a hard, like, I've never had to do a layoff. Yeah. Um, I think that would be a very difficult scenario to be in and taking it just way too personally. Uh, but 
that you know that it that is the case. I think one of the advantages in our field in marketing is less of our work is project based and more of it's retainer based. Mm -hmm. So that does make it a little bit easier in the sense that uh, there's not a lot of monthly fluctuation in billables. Mm. Uh, you tend to know like and you could you could project the year fairly well yeah. um, what you have based on your current clients. We do really well as far as we have minimal churn. So I think that's another that speaks to what the agent, how well the agency does as far as the quality of the work. But we very rarely lose a client. Um, and it's usually if they do, it's, you know, they're moving on to some new project themselves, the client. Uh, but because of that, there's a lot of stability. Um, I don't really fear on a day-to-day -day basis, like, hey, we're gonna lose we're going to lose these clients and then therefore, you know, we're going to be scrambling on business development. Um, it doesn't make me go out to look for work when there's not a necessity to. Yeah. Um, and it's not growth just for the sake of growth. It's growth for what fits in with us as an agency. Let's take a turn and talk a little bit about uh, disappointments. Uh, maybe thinking about clients that you, maybe you weren't going after them in the beginning, but you got to a point in, in trying to pursue them and you were excited this was gonna be an amazing connection taking to the next level and it didn't work out. Do you have any stories about that? Yeah, there's a, there's a few. I think, you know, the, the process of pitching a client is always a hard one because you're spending a lot of energy, you're spending a lot of resources. Um, I know there's been a few times we've flown out to, yeah. you know, meet with a client to do the pitch, um, you know, and in your mind, all that time you've spent analyzing their needs to pitch to them, uh, it helps you get so excited about the project, right? So you're like, oh, I, I, you know, we've got invited in on this RFP, you know, we've done, you know, gone through all their numbers and gone through, and we're building strategies, you know, that we can present. And, you know, there's other good agencies out there, you get it, you don't win every, uh, every pitch you take. So there's times where you go and you know you're so excited and you're like oh man I've got this one in the bag and they go with another agency and it's it's a little bit like you kind of fly back to Maine with your well you don't know until you get home but <laughs> you know you kind of just like you, when you know when they send you that email saying hey we've got another direction you kind of you know it, yeah. it's, it bums you out a little yeah, bit on that it's, yeah it's yeah learning experiences from that did you take something away from it that you were able to put put to use later on. Um, I think one of it is one of the things is understanding, um, you know, what really is the intent? Did you get an RFP because they're just trying to tick a box to say we have to have X amount of agencies come in, but we, you know, basically we're already going to work with our incumbent agency. So, you know, the expense and time of trying to put a presentation together for that. But again, that's just part of that's the nature of that's the nature yeah. of the work. You know, you, 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 you go through the steps, you know, and you might build a brand new long-term relationship and that's that's what you got to do to take that yeah i think uh it reminds me of a story i think it was in the 90s carl malone basketball fan mm -hmm. are you a basketball fan not not too much i mean he played for the utah jazz and they lost again to michael jordan and the bulls and scotty pippen <laughs> and uh at, at the end of the post game they're having interviews well i'm glad by the way you gave scotty pippen due just in case he listens <laughs> to the podcast in, exactly yeah Exactly. That's why. Yeah, yeah, just in job. case he's good coming job. next week. Yeah. And so they ask him, you know, what what did you learn this time from losing? And you know, Carl Malone had kind of a, a country accent. He said, "Well, I learned it sucks to lose." <laughs> it, you know. Yeah. Please Google it and watch the the real version, yeah. and uh, it, it's funny. It does suck to lose, though. <laughs> it does suck to lose, right? I mean, it sucks to lose when you lose a um, on a pitch. It sucks to lose when you lose a client. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I, again, you lose clients and it, it's always to me, like, like the hardest part, because I want to be like, oh, what could I have done differently or what, you know, maybe I should have, you know, changed resources here or done, you know, or spoken up. And sometimes clients just aren't good fits either personality wise, but then kind of mentally being like, oh, I wish I wish I could get these guys back and like and obsessing about what their numbers look like instead of just being like, all right, well, that that was a project we worked on mm. this year. And but you know what, we've got clients who love us and trust us. And, 
you know, let's just really double on down on those ones that we're seeing those great results and people who trust our vision for, yeah. for their, and you know, it's a, it's a lot of trust, right? Be like clients are giving us thousands and thousands of dollars to spend in media for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trusting us to get the strategy, right? They that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a huge amount of trust. And that's like, you know, when you, when you have that, like, just to feel like, yeah, I really want to reward that trust with putting out just some exceptional work. Yeah. Now let's talk about the opposite end of the spectrum, the successes, right? Was there a moment as you're going through these 13 years where you got a client that you just never expected and you were, and it was just, you were just so excited, so high about it. If you're watching this and you're one of our clients, <laughs> The answer is you. <laughs> you are the special one. You are the special client. You know who you are. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there are. I'm not going to go. We'll get it out. Yeah, post, don't I don't worry, want. I don't want to be like I have a favorite <laughs> child. Um, but yeah, no, there's there's definitely been clients I've been just like over the moon. Um, either to get or expand services. I'd imagine with. it's like when you're a smaller company with certain size clients and you get a particularly large one yeah that was bigger like catching a fish right you're happy you caught all the fish right and i i think <laughs> like it's really the tools and the resources they have to work with right so like there's a huge excitement when you get a larger corporate client that has a lot of resources because there's it just you know there's a lot more you can do a lot more you can test mm -hmm. um and and there's brand knowledge behind it as well so the the building blocks are there you know, it's a little bit more difficult, smaller clients or, you know, what's always a difficult situation is if you have a client that's coming to you because their performance has been really bad. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the marketing has been bad, but the product is not great. Yeah. Or the company culture that has caused that product to not mm -hmm. be great is not super great. Yeah. And then you realize pretty quickly, you know, that they expect you to use marketing to be this magic you know, marketing is marketing is magic, right. right? What would you say about that? With what are the typical client expectations coming in versus the reality of what should be expected? You know, that is all across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that speaks to the professionalism of the client too. Um, you know, clients with developed marketing departments or marketing resources that are internal, they have a lot more. Um, measured expectations working with an agency and understanding you know things take time it's not a sprint it's it's a large momentum moving endeavor um, sometimes smaller clients with smaller budgets they're the ones that are just like i want to expend as little as possible right but i i want to see amazing results right. and that can be hard to temper that realistically and it can be hard because again the process of bringing on a new client right you've got two or three other agencies they're talking to and they're all like oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna make you rich or we're gonna we're just gonna you know like and and throw in projected numbers so that's a hard one when you're going into those situations and you're like here's what i think is realistic yeah. you know like looking at what your footprint what your tech stack is this is where i see you at um again it's it's people who are used to that idea of those of being fed those higher expectations that may not be realistic. Um, then they get in a situation where you know they expect more. Mm. And but I think that also speaks to churn, right? Mm. So I think a lot of these agencies that over promise in the pitch, then they get the client and the client stays with them six months to a year. Maybe they sign them on a one year deal. And they never resign after the one year because mm -hmm. the expectations were that were given them were so much higher. And we get a lot of that. Like people mm -hmm. we pitch or people that come to us, I should say, and they're very disillusioned because a marketing agency has just promised them the moon. And, you know, and, and, and when you see what they were promised, you're like, well, that's not reasonable to expect that. Yeah. Um, but that's what the, you know, the end client thought, you know, they, they, they were sold the vision yeah, let me talk about that. Other agencies um, that do overpromise. Yeah, how do you view them? Are they just naive? Are they just hungry? Are they scammy? What do you think is going on with with those? Types I think of there's agencies? like the full spectrum of those things that you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's some that are, some that are inexperienced. 
a lot of them are hungry, especially newer agencies. I think the HubSpot ecosystem was a lot like that, especially like when you think, think like four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of like people that were like, oh, it's easy to get into marketing. You can just, hub, you know, get HubSpot, be a HubSpot partner. Right. And HubSpot's going to ha tell you to do things the HubSpot way. And you're mm -hmm. just going to follow it and be a HubSpot mm -hmm. evangelist. And it will all work out. And, you know, and HubSpot was very optimistic. Yeah. And then so they took that type of like over optimization, optim op optimization, opti no optimization. No, op no, that's not right. Op Overly optimistic. optimistic. There's the word words, right? Um, took that and <laughs> ran with it as far as, um, y you know, what they promised the clients. And then and like HubSpot, you know, and then they turn off HubSpot, they turn off the agency. And, you know, where I think if it was a little bit more tempered coming in, they like they probably retain clients better. But you see a lot of those early HubSpot agencies that are all either mm -hmm. absorbed or they've moved on to other other things. They're all crypto managers now. Oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they have these because uh, I've seen agencies that are that way. They're very sales yeah. forward. Yeah. I mean, they're just pushing out 50. They, you know, they'll even tell you. You have to make fifty cold calls a day, right, to new clients, and yeah, and they and they, I think their churn is three or four months, right, if they don't sign them for a long term contract, and that to me is just misery. Yeah, you're just, you're never attending to a client, developing, and from what I see here, it takes time to to develop, make sure you're getting the the numbers are coming in that are correct, and then you can slowly dial things in. Yeah, and that's that measured approach, I think, is what gets missed. You know, that idea of like, we're just going to throw a bunch of stuff on the wall, yeah. you know, and we're going to do the flashy things. Oh, you know what you should have? TikTok. TikTok is <laughs> every, everybody, you, that's going to solve your, you know, like, yeah, TikTok is not going to make your company successful just because you started a TikTok account. Right. You, you know, like, you know, like that's like, exam, you know, like, yeah, yeah. that's an oversimplification of it, but it's just like, sometimes they just, throw it as the flashy they want in, the silver bullet yeah the silver yeah. bullet what's in vogue right now as far as what they see other clients doing uh, i mean other agencies doing and that i think versus like the really fundamentals mm. yeah that's all the kind of getting into the nitty-gritty of the the analytics is that a challenge getting because on a larger company for example they might have a marketing team and and they have their way of managing the that data and they're bringing you or us on as the digital side of it. And you have to play in their playground effectively with their data. Is that a frustration sometimes, or how does that go? It can be. Um, sometimes the trouble is getting the appropriate data. Mm -hmm. And and again, like larger clients, there's a lot of um, sensitivities about internal data and an external team accessing data points, yeah. which you know we understand. Um, you know, sometimes it's a case of, you know, we've been brought in, but there's internal resources that have very different views of how marketing should be done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's those sensitivities as well. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's a case of, you know, we just want to work with internal marketing teams and not coming across as though we're there to fix things or change things versus really supplementing their efforts. Um, so that can be that can be hard too to convey that as far as the collaborativeness versus that not getting combative with in-house marketing directors or marketing teams. Yeah, interesting. So, thirteen years to kind of bring it back to where we started. Thirteen years you've been doing this, and that to me that shows that you have a good ability to plan financially because you didn't hit a wall. Because I can imagine there were moments where you're coming up against some financial stresses. Is there a certain amount of months that you try to keep in the bank for bad times? Or how do you how do you handle that side of it? Yeah, we so I think that also goes to being conservative both on my personal finances, so how much I take out of the company. Um, but also I think that's just being conservative with company expenditures. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can be a trap, right? You get bigger, you get a lot of software, like there's a lot of, you have to examine like, am I, am I expending like on subscriptions that we don't really need? Am I, you know, that side of things, you know, as far as planning for that, 
I think that's a part of that is not overscaling is really what it comes down yeah. to understanding like the personnel that I have in place for the amount of retainers I have. Um, and that's the situation. These these agencies, they scale so quickly. They bring a lot of workforce and yeah. workforce that may not be that experienced all at once or used to working with each other. But then they need sales to start churning out or and then the sales that side. So I think if you take a measured ex, um, approach to growth, um, you know, maybe you bring on two, three clients a year versus mm -hmm. that idea of an, I need 20 clients to come on. Right. Um, it gives you the ability to do it in a, a responsible way. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thanks, Bill. Did Deb come up with any questions? Okay. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we go to the rapid, well, What's so rapid fire questions from around the rapid office. Rapid fire questions. All right. <laughs> so if you had to fire one person in this office besides present company, <laughs> Uh, oh, well, it couldn't be me. Who would it be? No pressure. This is coming from Anna Lynn. You know what? If I had to fire one person, it would be the property management company in this building. Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's a good answer. That's a politically That's a correct safe answer. answer. Safe answer. Uh, here's a fun question. What's the longest you've ever held a serious face in a meeting without actually listening? Oh man, loaded question. I think I've done an hour. I think I've done, you know, and I'm very, I will tell you this. I am very good at a head nod to go along with a sentiment of what's going on in the meeting if I'm not actually mentally there. Okay. Yeah, I'm very good to be like, hmm. Mm, you mm. know, I kind of got that feeling a couple times during this podcast, but mm. that's exactly. See? <laughs> See? You were good though, mm -hmm. you, you know? Yeah. Uh, what's the most outrageous expense you've approved without reading the fine print? Asking for a friend. I am asking for a friend. Anna Lynn. <laughs> that would be a hard that would be a hard question to ask. I wonder I wonder what that would be. No. Um You know, we've gotten some things like office swag things that have been a little bit more expensive than I anticipated or realized until after I looked at the invoice, but like I, Thai lunch today. Yeah, or <laughs> or you know, a crate of <laughs> Yeti cups. Yeti, you know, brought to you by Yeti. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Yeti today. Oh, the pointy awards, that was pretty pretty frivolous. So those who don't know, we it got us a client though. It got us a client. So, but we we reenacted the uh awards the dundee awards from the office and the oh, and we did yeah. a red tie mm -hmm. event out back um that was that was a little bit on the frivolous side i think next year when we take everybody on a bus to gettysburg might also be in that realm we but booze cruise, first. booze cruise yeah it, we're gonna we're just reenacting the office now oh I yeah see. so okay because i was gonna suggest submarine trip to the titanic <laughs> but yeah yeah, I <laughs> the rage. Oh, I thought that's what the basement was. Yeah, the rage room. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get the next door one and then turn that into a rage room. <laughs> okay, okay. A new new question coming in. Uh, what team members' emails do you delete the most without reading? And I, by the way, before you, I'll let you think about that because I'm just sensing in these questions that are coming in a lot of insecurity. You Fired, you deleting that? emails. You Everyone's like, how have you been so successful? Everyone lives in fear, fear. in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably the person whose emails I delete the most without reading would either be Dan. Oh, that's sad. That makes I, me I sad know, a I know, bit. I know, I know. <laughs> or Courtney. Courtney probably believes... Yes. Oh, <laughs> Courtney believes it's her. Yeah. Courtney's like, I'm just confirming what I already know. <laughs> yeah. No, you know what I, you know what I do delete all the time, and that's why Courtney probably asked the question. Courtney always sends me meeting invites, and I somehow delete all the meeting invites that Courtney sends me, 
before I accept them. And then Courtney just has to go in and she just goes into my calendar and adds like manually, like just makes me have the meeting because she knows that <laughs> I, I'm not going to accept it. All right. Yeah. All right. So we have a pony question. Pony question. Pony question. Um, Annalyn was told that there was a office pony. Little Sebastian. Here's the question. How much longer do you think you can promise that before people quit? You know, I feel like that holding the carrot out yeah. on the pony issue has is, been what's kept people going for years. Oh, so you think it's the opposite. It's actually keeping them going. It's Keep, not driving them away. Right. Like, the, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're just like, maybe if you work a little harder, we'll get that pony. Ooh. Prove uh, me wrong, kids. Prove me wrong. I think I know the answer to this one. I think the answer is me. But the question is, if you could swap jobs with anyone in the company for a day, who would it be and why? Because <laughs> my job is pretty good so far. I, I might say Christy, just so I could be fabulous. I was going to say it was the purse. You want to carry the purse. No, just, you know, just to be that, like, sweet and sassy person who rules the office, like, okay. you know, and really is in charge of the office. Okay. I think okay. that would be a good one. Um... I admire Mark a lot, like in in his client, how he handles clients. So I mean, that would be kind of a fun one. Um, if I'm Tim for the day, do I get usage of his boat after hours? Yeah, that that would be. Good. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, but so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with Christy. I'm gonna Christy. go with Christy on that one. Okay, for the purse, from right. what I understood. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you you reference the office a lot. Yes. Um, in a previous interview you mentioned michael scott is your persona unfortunately but but i'm gonna ask to go a little deeper yes um why and is there anybody else that you have personality traits that you identify with well i i say that because i think like most men of my age would be like oh i'm jim you know like i i want to be jim they're fools by the way they're fools all right um, but then knowing like my propensity to make awkward moments yeah. in the office and, and you know what, you know, what's funny is I was actually thinking about this the other day as the company's gotten bigger and more roles in my, especially my interactions with clients can be much more like I'm there to listen to what the team has done. I personally haven't done the work. I'm just there to, you know, you know, observe and answer questions and be there support for the team. But because you don't have that like same, like, I'm not there to be like, your numbers increased by 12% because I did this thing on the ads. I feel like sometimes I'm falling into that trap of now just being like the kind of schmoozy cheerleader sometimes. And that's when you, the Michael Scott comes out because you're just trying to make conversation. And when you do, you just get into that, that awkward, (laughs) you know, that kind of awkward, like, Hey everybody. And you drop in and yeah. And you know, like everybody else is like really trying to do hard work and, you know, talk about the work and I'm just like, Hey, you know, a distraction. Yeah. 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 So I got to be careful of that a little bit. Yeah. I I think I could identify with that. I like Michael Scott's character, but I kind of feel like for me, he wanted to make people happy. And I I love that about him. I think that is the underlying, my Michael Scott part. Yeah. You know, I want people to be afraid of me, afraid of how much they love me. That's it. Yeah. And I also feel a similar, in the effort to make people happy and to love us, yeah, we're wildly offensive. That is also true. But it's so who was, sincere. Who was who was the boss on the office? Who was the boss in the office for that short period of time? Um, oh, he had a very unique uh, cadence the way he spoke, right? Yeah, it's California. yeah. What yeah. was it? Robert California. Robert California. California. That's really my ultimate goal, and I just eventually want to be Robert California. Okay. Do you have an inner persona, like a secret person you identify yeah, just, with that you've I, never told? I just answer the phone, and I'm like, I am the lizard king. You don't even know my real name. <laughs> you you want that level of uh, – it's, it's the tone of the voice he had. Yeah. I think that's what it is. I'm very sensitive to voice tones. So, Kevin. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. Is, are you firing me? Yes. Okay. Well, it was, it was a good run. It was a great run. Yes. I mean, day one podcast. But, you know <laughs> – 
we kind of like to bring in the office, fatten you up, and feed you. Yeah, yeah. And then just before we, you know, let you go, so you you feel yeah. like you leave on a. <laughs> well, I appreciate. It. I'm getting a little teary eyed. We're like, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta send Kevin out to the farm. <laughs> no. Um, no. Um. Thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah. Is this your first time on a podcast? This is my first time on a podcast. Yes. Wow. Maybe I've seen them. I've watched maybe them. Maybe you're just. You maybe you're like I'm a white guy with a microphone. This just feels so right to me. You're gonna just go home right. and start your own, your own podcast. Right. There was yeah. a guy in Germany that did that. Yeah. He felt very empowered with a microphone. It didn't end well for him. <laughs> Don't start growing little mustaches. No little mustaches. Um. But yeah. Yeah. It, so. <laughs> this went off the rails. <laughs> Yeah. So this is called the deep dive podcast. Yeah. The deep dive. The deep dive. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here with us on the podcast today. Thanks to Kevin and his first time on the podcast. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have him again. And when we uh, can think of more exciting things to talk about. Yeah. We'll see you then. Catch you next. Catch you next time, everybody. It's the end. No, it's not. There's more. There's always more. Don't be sad. You can catch our full video interviews on our YouTube channel. Come find us. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share with your friends so that we're not sad. And follow us on TikTok. And Instagram. It'll make your day happier, promise. And we'll know if you do. <laughs> Until next time. <laughs>